Good evening. Joining me on the line here for After Dark is social entrepreneur and commentator from Littleton, Camille Young. Good evening, Camille. Good evening. How are you tonight? I'm very good. And this evening you're going to have a talk to us with your ideas around universal basic income. That's right. Um, where should we start? Do you have any questions or do you want me to dive in? Well, let's, uh, let's talk about the notion of UBI. What, what actually is it? Well, it, it's, the concept is, is that everybody would receive a basic income. So that means some base income upon which they can then spend for their daily needs and then anything over and above that that they would earn through their job. And the kind of idea of it is um, that we all have certain basic needs that we need to cover and um, our current economic systems are not distributing wealth in such a way that we can cover those. So we end up with quite a, a large number of, let's say, social ills, social problems. Is there, and, is, is there, um, an, is there an implied um, dis, <clears throat> excuse me, is there a, an implied problem with disincentive to work because you know that your basic needs are going to be met? Well, and, and that's kind of, we, we've come to an age where um, we have created, a, it's a quite a complex economic system, um, argument here. So in our, um, we're at the end of what I would call the production age. And at the end of the production age, what's happened is we've um, consolidated an enormous amount of wealth into the hands of a few through essentially economic systems. And what that means is the people that are actually creating that wealth aren't really benefiting from that wealth because it's going into the owners of the business, but not the people who actually create the work. Let's think about clothing manufacturing or food manufacturing or um, any of those kind of things. Often um, the cost, uh, the real cost of production isn't actually showing up. So one of the things that can rebalance the economics of today is a universal basic income. Now, there's a lot of arguments in the world um, and tests around this, particularly in Europe, for um, what that might look like at a societal scale. And uh, mostly it's governments that are leading this. I personally think that there's another way, another way to approach it, which is essentially um, designing businesses that are regenerative by nature, which is essentially looking at how we can actually put our money into companies that then distribute wealth equitably. So instead of us buying from large corporations that have a tendency to consolidate wealth into the hands of a few, we could actually be spending our money in, at, in economies that are circular and regenerative. Before we go into that in more detail, I'd just like to have a look at the, at the present system we have where yeah. we've got um, working for families t tax payments, which are mm -hmm. essentially like um, a refund, if you like, um, yeah. back into the family. But the problem is, it seems to me that um, the government is effectively subsidizing low wages. Um, you, you could definitely see that way. Now, to me, and I'm, I don't know enough ins and outs of the New Zealand's working for family system, um, so I, I don't want to really comment on that. It wouldn't be quite right. And I think what happens through government policy is usually um, micro moments of correction that have often um, side effects that are unaccounted for. Now, what I, what I think is possible is, is instead of looking to the government to try to equalize things, we as citizens start to invest in the change that we want to see through business. So, and I've, I've yet to see a government anywhere in the world um, that doesn't have, uh, let's say, extreme high costs because they're trying to reduce risks and liabilities, and that means that they operate with um, very high costs. Now, what I would think would be a much, let's say, more effective approach is for each of us to be much more conscious about where we invest our money, which is in, a, in private companies that are intentionally designed to distribute wealth. Can I, just I think point it would be out, far more effective. Can I just point out, that's all very yeah. well, but most people don't have yeah. any money left over to invest or save towards their retirements or what have you. In order for people to have that money, they'd have to not be paying tax on their income. You're probably right, actually, because the world is actually so skewed today. I, I don't, I don't disagree with you, and I have read some of the statistics that says that most people are living in extreme debt. But there, there are ways to start to, and I say invest, but it's actually spend money, so that you're paying into a system that distributes wealth more equitably. So we all spend money every day, 
um, I'm going to guess that that's probably a universal average, particularly in New Zealand. Um, there may be some people that get through a day or two, but at some point in the week, you're going to need to buy food or gas or those kind of things, electricity, everything. And if we can start to look at where we're spending that money, we can start to do that in ways that will distribute wealth rather than consolidate wealth. And I believe that if we invest in those businesses by how we actually move our money through our daily lives, we can create large systemic change. But how, it's really a conscious choice into where we want to spend our money. How can I, let's just say I run a car, um, how can yeah. I buy fuel in a way that's going to, where the fuel company will reinvest back into society? Well, to, we're at the cusp of what I think is a new age of business. And so most of the businesses that we need aren't actually there yet, but they're starting to appear. So right now, the best way to do that would be, and there's examples of this in other countries in the world where you could actually, instead of owning your own car, you can actually um, use a car in a share car program. And if those cars are electric, then you're using renewable energy. And if you can get into a cooperatively shared car system, then not only are you, um, you're, you're very much so reducing your own costs, but if you can actually own a part of that car system, you're also potentially gaining from others using the car. So with you the, distribute that wealth. With the Collett's Corner concept, were you mm -hmm. looking at shared ownership in electric vehicles as part of that setup? Um, I think we're not quite ready for that, to be perfectly honest, in New Zealand. So what often happens with change is you need to take steps towards it. And so right now for that one, what I would prefer to see is the step towards the collectively owned shared cars. Instead, I think it would be much more interesting to um, uh, work with the Yugo car system that the council already has set up and try to bring them in to um, bring in four to five cars that they might have at the building that they the residents and other um, the people that are working in the building could become, um, say, members of, and so they have a swipe card to use those cars. That means they're not paying for the maintenance, they're not paying for the car itself, they're just paying for the use of the car. And when we've calculated the kind of costs that would reduce over a year, it's quite a lot. Are there any countries, and I imagine if there are, it's probably a Nordic one, but are mm. there any countries that are actually practice, practicing UBI at the moment? The one that I've um, heard of has done a trial is one of the Scandinavian countries. And, um, well, and I have to actually read up on how it's going. I don't know the conclusions on it, but I should have before we had this talk. Um, they did a two-year test pilot with um, one large um, group of the population. Now, a lot of people have criticized that that's not the best way to actually test a UBI because a UBI is um, about going into, let's say, uh, an abundance mindset rather than a scarcity mindset. So if you know that you've only got this for two years, you know it's going to end. So you don't actually shift behaviors. So you can't actually make the changes that a UBI might offer a society if you know that it's going to be ending. It has but, been um, those were the critiques, of it, so I don't, I don't know how it's gone. It would be interesting to find out. It has been said that um, by with the introduction of UBI, you do away with benefits and all of the expense of administering and policing those payments. Um, I've heard that as well. Um, and it, each one of the economic studies that I've seen of it has argued a case on either side of that, and you could hear pros and cons. Now, often when people can meet their basic needs, they will have, um, the argument goes that they'll have less social demands, um, and then that, that may or may not be true, but we don't know until we actually test this at a large scale. And then, of course, the, the other side of that argument is, well, people will always need um, social services. So we, those are the kind of things that we would need to test before we'd have certainty. The crux of it, I guess, is what happens to productivity because mm. you, you get the um, the additional, like the cream on the cake, the nice things in life if you're prepared to go out and work and do well in your profession and craft or, or whatever, yeah. service industry or whatever it is you do. And those that don't are less inclined to work, maybe they're quite happy to do other things in the community rather than earn additional money. Well, and this is where I think the argument's quite strong, is that everybody um, is actually, well, not everybody, but um, there are, there's a huge amount of unpaid labor that goes on in society, and that's um, anybody who's doing care for, um, whether it's child care or elderly care, 
um, anybody who's, I call it the um, invisible work that goes unpaid, the volunteer work, the community-based work. Now, if there was a universal basic income, those kind of people could still choose to do that work, but they wouldn't be, let's say, penalized effectively because they're not, they don't have any income on which to support themselves. So there, there is a hypothesis that says that those people then would actually be able to sustain the work that they do. Now, if somebody woke up and they decided they ended up wanting to be, I don't know, uh, grow roses for the rest of their lives, and they were happy to live on their universal basic income, I think that's okay. Like, we've hit a point in our, in our production that we don't need to measure the well-being of a society through its economic um, value. And what we're trying to always do is create a planet in the last century that is somehow, it's, 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 Health is measured by its GDP, which means production is the only measurement that we've considered. But it doesn't make any sense because actually we've sort of hit the boundaries of what our planet can sustain. So we're at a time in history where we need to change our value systems. And I think with that, we'll probably figure out how better to distribute wealth so we can actually all make a lot more choices in how we want to live. We talked last week about the uh, potential benefits of working less. It seems to me that that might work in or dovetail quite nicely with this idea of the universal basic income. It certainly does. I mean, I don't think there's a whole lot of people that wake up on a Monday morning at whatever time and go, yes, I can't wait to work for 40 hours. This is actually a product of the production age, which is a routine that's come on because of, let's say, the industrial era. But we're at the tail end of that, and our planet is trying to get us there as fast as possible with all of, obviously, the alarming bells that are going off in the way of um, climate change and species collapse. So we have to change. We have to fundamentally change our behaviors. And some of those may be welcome changes, and some of them may not be. But one of the very strong cases is um, to really change our economic models. Have you given any thought to what the figure might be for an adult in New Zealand? universal basic income given the there, um, given the you know the costs of, of life today well these are extremely complex equations that um, need to take into consideration cost of food cost of rent location where you're based um, I, I, I have not done those calculations but I know they have been done and I know they vary based on where you are in the country um, so it, it you, I, I couldn't comment on that the actual figures no I'm sorry but the, the Auckland weighting would be different to the Wellington, to the Christchurch, to, Christ to, the Church, to Hamilton. To, yeah, exactly. Fascinating. It's really interesting um, to have these talks with you, Camille, and we hope we can have some more. Thank you very much for talking about the idea of a universe of basic income with us this week on After Dark. Have a wonderful evening. Good night. Good night. You too.